have one. That night, I cut off the little braid on the back of my head. Dad noticed first. Oh, good, he said. I never liked that thing. Via couldn't believe I had cut it off. That took you years to grow, she said, almost like she was angry. Why did you cut it off? I don't know, I answered. Did someone make fun of it? No. Did you tell Christopher you were cutting it off? We're not even friends anymore. That's not true, she said. I can't believe you would just cut it off like that, she added snottily, and then practically slammed my bedroom door shut as she left the room. I was snuggling with Daisy on my bed when Dad came to tuck me in later. He scooched Daisy over gently and lay next to me on the blanket. So, Augie Doggy, he said, it was really an okay day. He got that from an old cartoon about a dachshund named Augie Doggy, by the way. He had bought it for me on eBay when I was about four, and we watched it a lot for a while, especially in the hospital. He would call me Augie Doggy, and I would call him Dear Old Dad, like the puppy called the dachshund dad on the show. Yeah, it was totally okay, I said, nodding. You've been so quiet all night long. I guess I'm tired. It was a long day, huh? I nodded. But it was really okay? I nodded again. He didn't say anything, so after a few seconds I said, It was better than okay, actually. That's great to hear, Augie, he said quietly, kissing my forehead. So it looks like it was a good call Mom made. You're going to school? Yeah, but I could stop going if I wanted to, right? That was the deal, yes, he answered. Though I guess it would depend on why you wanted to stop going too, you know. You'd have to let us know. You'd have to talk to us and tell us how you're feeling and if anything was happening, okay? You promise you'd tell us? Yeah. So can I ask you something? Are you mad at mom or something? You've been kind of huffy with her all night long. You know, Augie, I'm as much to blame for sending you to school as she is. No, she's more to blame. It was her idea. Mom knocked on the door just then and peeked her head inside my room. Just wanted to say goodnight, she said. She looked kind of shy. Hi, Mama, Dad said, picking up my hand and waving it at her. Waving it at her. I heard you cut off your braid, Mom said to me sitting down at the edge of the bed next to Daisy. It's not a big deal, I answered quickly. I didn't say it was, said Mom. Why don't you put Augie to bed tonight, Dad said to Mom, getting up. I've got some work to do anyway. Good night, my son, my son. That was another part of our Augie doggy routine, though I wasn't in the mood to say good night, dear old Dad. I'm so proud of you, Dad said, and then he got up out of the bed. Mom and Dad had always taken turns putting me to bed. I know it was a little babyish of me to still need them to do that, but that's just how it was with us. Will you check on Via? Mom said to Dad as she lay down next to me. He stopped by the door and turned around. What's wrong with Via? Nothing, said Mom, shrugging. At least that she would tell me. But first day of high school and all that. Hmm, said Dad. And then he pointed his finger at me and winked. It's always something with you kids, isn't it? He said. Never a dull moment, Mom said. Never a dull moment, Dad repeated. Good night, guys. As soon as he closed the door, Mom pulled out the book she'd been reading to me for the last couple of weeks. I was relieved because I wasn't, I was really afraid she wanted to talk, and I just didn't feel like doing that. But Mom didn't seem to want to talk either. She just flipped through the pages until she got to where we had left off. We were about halfway through The Hobbit. Stop, stop, shouted Thorin, said Mom, reading aloud. But it was too late. The excited dwarves had wasted their last arrows, and now the bows that Thorin had given them were useless. They were a gloomy party that night, and the gloom gathered still deeper on them in the following days. They had crossed the enchanted stream, but beyond it the path seemed to straggle on just as before, and in the forest they could see no change. I'm not sure why, but all of a sudden I started to cry. Mom put the book down and wrapped her arms around me. She didn't seem upset that I was crying. It's okay, she whispered in my ear. It'll be okay. I'm sorry, I said between sniffles. Shh, she said, wiping my tears with the back of her hand. You have nothing to be sorry about. Why do I have to be so ugly, Mommy? I whispered. No, baby, you're not. 
I know I am. She kissed me all over my face. She kissed my eyes that came down too far. She kissed my cheeks that looked punched in. She kissed my tortoise mouth. She said soft words that I know were meant to help me, but words can't change my face. Wake me up when September ends. The rest of September was hard. I wasn't used to getting up so early in the morning. I wasn't used to this whole notion of homework. And I got my first quiz at the end of the month. I never got quizzes when mom homeschooled me. I also didn't like how I had no free time anymore. Before, I was able to play whenever I wanted to, but now it felt like I always had stuff to do for school. And being at school was awful in the beginning. Every new class I had was like a new chance for kids not to stare at me. They would sneak peeks at me from behind their notebooks or when they thought I wasn't looking. They would take the longest way around me to avoid bumping into me in any way like I had a, some kind of germ they could catch, like my face was contagious. In the hallways, which were always crowded, my face would always surprise some unsuspecting kid who maybe hadn't heard about me. The kid would make the sound you make when you hold your breath before going underwater, a little <gasps> sound. This happened maybe four or five times a day for the first few weeks. On the stairs, in front of the lockers, in the library, 500 kids in a school, Eventually, every one of them was going to see my face at some time. And I knew after the first couple of days that word had gotten around about me because every once in a while, I'd catch a kid elbowing his friend as they passed me or talking behind their hands as I walked by them. I can only imagine what they were saying about me. Actually, I preferred not to even try to imagine it. I'm not saying they were doing any of these things in a mean way, by the way. Not once did any kid laugh or make noises or do anything like that. They were just being normal, dumb kids. I know that. I kind of wanted to tell them that. Like, it's okay. I know I'm weird looking. Take a look. I don't bite. Hey, the truth is, if a Wookiee started going to the school all of a sudden, I'd be curious. I'd probably stare a bit. And if I was walking with Jack or Summer, I'd probably whisper to them, Hey, there's a Wookiee. And if the Wookiee caught me saying that, he'd know I wasn't trying to be mean. I was just pointing out the fact that he's a Wookiee. It took about one week for the kids in my class to get used to my face. These were kids I'd see every day in all my classes. It took about two weeks for the rest of the kids in my grade to get used to my face. These were the kids I'd see in the cafeteria, yard time, PE, music, library, computer class. It took about a month for the rest of the kids in the entire school to get used to it. These were the kids in all the other grades. They were big kids, some of them. Some of them had crazy haircuts. Some of them had earrings in their noses. Some of them had pimples. None of them looked like me. Jack Will. I hung out with Jack in homeroom, English, history, computer, music, and science, which were all the classes we had together. The teacher assigned seats in every class, and I ended up sitting next to Jack in every single class, so I figured either the teachers were told to put me and Jack together, or it was a totally incredible coincidence. I walked to classes with Jack, too. I know he noticed kids staring at me, but he pretended not to notice. One time, though, on our way to history, this huge eighth grader who was zooming down the stairs two steps at a time accidentally bumped into us at the bottom of the stairs and knocked me down. As the guy helped me stand up, he got a look at my face, and without even meaning to, he just said, whoa, then patted me on the shoulder like he was dusting me off and took off after his friends. For some reason, me and Jack started cracking up. <laughs> that guy made the funniest face, said Jack as we sat down at our desks. I know, right? I said. He was like, whoa, I swear I think he wet his pants. We were laughing so hard that the teacher that the teacher, Mr. Roche, had asked us to settle down. Later, after we finished reading about how ancient Sumerians built sundials, Jack whispered, do you ever want to beat those kids up? I shrugged. I guess. I don't know. I'd want to. I think you should get a secret squirt gun or something and attach it to your eyes somehow. And every time someone stares at you, you would squirt them in the face. With some green slime or something, I answered. No, no, with slug juice mixed with dog pee. Yeah, I said, completely agreeing. Guys, said Mr. Roche from across the room, people are still reading. We nodded and looked down at our books. Then Jack whispered, 
Are you always going to look this way, August? I mean, can't you get plastic surgery or something? I smiled and pointed to my face. Hello, this is after plastic surgery. Jack clapped his hand over his forehead and started laughing hysterically. Dude, you should sue your doctor, he answered between giggles. This time, the two of us were laughing so much we couldn't stop, even after Mr. Roche came over and made us both switch chairs with the kids next to us. Mr. Brown's October Precept Mr. Brown's precept for October was, Your deeds are your monuments. He told us that this was written on the tombstone of some Egyptian guy that died thousands of years ago. Since we were just about to start studying ancient Egypt, ancient Egypt and history, Mr. Brown thought it was a good choice for a precept. Our homework assignment was to write a paragraph about what we thought the precept meant or how we felt about it. This is what I wrote. This precept means that we should be remembered for the things we do. The things we do are the most important things of all. They are more important than what we say or what we look like. The things we do outlast our morality. The things we do are like monuments that people build to honor heroes after they've died. They're like the pyramids that the Egyptians built to honor the pharaohs. Only, instead of being made out of stone, they're made out of the memories people have of you. That's why your deeds are like your monuments, built with memories instead of with stone.